So we are all aware that CPAP refers to the process of application of positive airway pressure to a spontaneously breathing neonate throughout the respiratory cycle. So both during inspiration and expiration. In neonates, uh, when respiratory support, when therapy started initially with mechanical ventilation, the first clinical use of CPAP was uh, reported by Gregory as early as 1971. However, it took almost 20 years for neonatologists to actually realize the clinical benefits of CPAP when they realized that despite the armamentorium of therapies and um, newer modes of ventilation and newer types and makes of mechanical ventilators, the incidence of bronchopulmonary dysplasia or chronic lung disease was actually on the rise. So then uh, studies from uh, Columbia University in the United States showed that newborns who are managed without ventilation and with bubble CPAP achieve the least rates of bronchopulmonary dysplasia. So this made the use of non-invasive ventilatory modes, particularly CPAP, popular among both the high income and low middle income countries. And today CPAP uh, remains the primary mode of respiratory support in preterm very low birth weight neonates. And um, uh, there are increasing uh, units which are now using HFNC or heated humidified high flow nasal cannula. We all know that CPAP prevents alveolar collapse, um, uh, particularly the alveoli with marginal stability, which are surfactant deficient alveoli. It aids in the better recruitment of alveoli and helps in maintaining the lung volume at functional residual capacity. So normally in, uh, in, uh, during the respiratory cycle and particularly in preterm neonates, uh, there would be a tendency for end expiratory collapse as you can see in the last um, picture here when the baby goes into expiration. Usually in surfactant replete individuals, the alveolar volume is conserved because of uh, the presence of surfactant towards the end of expiration, although the alveolar volume tends to come down. But in three terms uh, who are surfactant deficient, there can be end expiratory collapse of alveoli leading to compromise in the functional residual capacity. With CPAP, the diameter of the alveoli is increased and this results in the maintenance of the alveolar patency even at the end of expiration. And uh, uh, the loss of uh, lung volume that is normally seen, it shuts off the terminal airway. So closing volume or the least volume which is required for keeping the alveoli open is achieved by using bubble CPAP or uh, continuous positive air pressure. So by this, we help the preterm newborn achieve the functional residual uh, capacity or to reach the best part of the pressure volume loop as we discussed in the previous uh, session by Dr. Arvinda, where the compliance is most favorable, that the unit increase in volume per unit increase in pressure is at the best possible uh, achievable rate. So this is possible by uh, the use of continuous positive uh, airway pressure, where the FRC of the baby's lung is maintained at a certain level above the closing volume. So in a typical uh, uh, HMD, the, uh, the FRC uh, often goes to less than the closing volume and there can be phases in the respiratory cycle uh, when the, the alveolar completely collapsed, especially towards the end of expiration. This is averted with the use of CPAP. So when we look at all the mechanisms of action of CPAP, CPAP not only prevents the collapse of the alveoli with marginal stability, as we discussed just now, by recruitment and by increase in the functional residual capacity, which in turn promotes better gas exchange. It also stabilizes the chest wall, which is very compliant in preterm babies, which reduces the airway resistance. And this also reduces the work of breathing. By sprinting and opening the airway, CPAP reduces the incidence of obstructive apneas. And by stretching the lung and the upper airway, which in turn stimulates the pulmonary receptors of pain tail, uh, which are stretch receptors, it reduces both central as well as obstructive apneas. So to summarize, CPAP helps in better recruitment of the lung, which increases the functional residual capacity, reduces the airway resistance, and helps by mitigating the incidence of both central and obstructive apneas. By all these mechanisms, CPAP lowers the pulmonary vascular resistance and PPHN and improves the ventilation perfusion mismatch 
and helps in better gas exchange and by reducing the intra pulmonary shunt shunting of blood now going on to the practical aspects of any cpap system there are different types of cpap but all the systems must contain three essential components these include the gas source the pressure generator and the patient interface gas source is typically a blend of warm humidified heated humidified gases which are blended air and oxygen blended in order to provide a certain oxygen concentration or fractional inspired oxygen concentration that is desired pressure generator is the mechanism of creating positive pressure in the circuit or uh, this is the mechanism of providing resistance to the flow of gas which helps in generating peep or delivering peep to the baby this is possible by the valve the expiratory valve as we discussed in the first session which is there in mechanical ventilator and this is uh, used for providing ventilator cpap or in uh, underwater bubble cpap circuit this is achieved by the underwater immersion of the expiratory limb into a fixed depth of water the third essential component for delivering cpap is the patient interface or the delivery system this is used for connecting the cpap circuit to the infant's airway this can be possible either by a short binasal prongs or by nasal mask and by other interfaces which we'll be discussing such as the ram scanner so putting this in the form of a figure the air and oxygen blended gas is heated and humidified by uh, a servo controlled humidifier which then passes via the cpap circuit delivered to the patient by uh, an interface which can be a short binasal prongs or a nasal mask and uh, the expiratory limb is uh, either immersed in water in case of a underwater bubble cpap or resistance can be offered by expiratory valve as seen in a ventilator cpap with the infant flow driver cpap the mechanism of pressure generation is slightly different so coming to the types of cpap based on the gas flow we have two different types of pressure generator one is the continuous flow constant flow cpap devices all cpap devices basically are continuous flow devices the constant flow cpap devices include the bubble cpap and the ventilator cpap whereas variable flow cpap device includes infant flow driver and um, there are other mechanisms like the viasis cpap so this uh, the picture on the left represents the bubble cpap which we are all quite familiar with and uh, the picture on the right represents uh, a, a ventilator that is being used to deliver cpap so when we treat bubble cpap uh, gas at a constant flow rate passes across the inspiratory circuit across the patient interface which is represented here um, in the form of either a nasal binasal prongs or a endotracheal tube we generally do not prefer to deliver cpap with the endotracheal tube and the expiratory gases pass through the expiratory circuit whose other end is dipped in uh, underwater bubble chamber which is a mechanism for generating pressure with bubble cpap so this is a schematic diagram we can see that the the blended uh, mix of air and oxygen which is uh, controlled by a flow rate the flow which is controlled using this flow meter passes via the heated humidifier system which is a servo control heated humidifier system through the inspiratory circuit and this represents the patient interface as i told usually we do not use the endotracheal tube this is merely for the schematic representation usually we use binasal prongs or a nasal mask and the expiratory limb is immersed within a bottle with filled with sterile water so there are uh, multiple studies which compare the bubble cpap with the ventilator cpap um, and most of the studies um, do not show a difference in extubation failure or some studies do show that bubble cpap may have slightly higher rate of success of cpap or reduced rate of extubation failure or cpap failure when compared to ventilator cpap so primarily in bubble cpap the pressure that is, that is generated is dependent on the flow and it is possible that the delivery of peep may be slightly higher than the pressure set at some points of time uh, one of the other advantages of bubble cpap is that the uh, the the breaks in the delivery of pressure can be indicated by 
absence or cessation of bubbling. So if the physician or the nurse spends sufficient time bedside, it is possible to identify those phases during which CPAP is not adequately delivered by identifying the phases where bubbling ceases to happen. So this ensures that continuous delivery of PEEP is uh, optimized throughout the respiratory cycle. The other advantage of bubble CPAP is that it saves a, a, a ventilator or a more uh, expensive device from being used merely for the delivery of uh, CPAP. And this ventilator can be more effectively put to use um, for another baby who actually requires to be on mechanical ventilation. Of course, bubble CPAP devices are also practically uh, you know, more reasonably priced and it is possible for the unit to have larger number of bubble CPAP devices when compared to the ventilators. Coming to the other type of CPAP, which is called the variable flow CPAP, as I told, there are different mechanisms or different uh, systems that uh, deliver variable flow CPAP. Uh, one of the common devices that we see in India is infant flow driver system. So in variable flow CPAP, the nose piece is designed to allow the coanda effect to achieve something called as a fluidic flip of the gas stream during exhalation. So typically with the infant flow driver CPAP as represented in this figure, we have the, uh, the nasal interface here, which is usually in the form of a short binasal prong that is connected to the patient. And we have a inspiratory circuit exactly like we have with the bubble CPAP circuit that is connected to the blended source of air and oxygen. In addition, there is another tubing here, which unlike the expiratory circuit of bubble CPAP, this is actually left open to the atmosphere. So during inspiration, when the baby inhales, a negative pressure is created at the, time, at the level of the interface. So this entrails an additional flow of gas from the atmosphere over and above the constant flow of gas that is coming from through the inspiratory circuit. So if we have a set flow of say six liters per minute, based on the negative pressure that is generated by the baby, an additional flow of gas will be entrailed from the atmosphere, which may be two or three liters per minute, leading to a net flow of gas of around eight or nine liters per minute. Whereas during exhalation, when the baby breathes out, the positive pressure that is created here actually generates the coanda effect or the fluidic flip, wherein some of the gas that is coming in from the inspiratory circuit or the bias flow of gas, some of it might be uh, diverted back or uh, uh, rooted back to the atmosphere. And this mechanism is uh, said to reduce the baby's work of breathing. So it inherently provides a higher blood, a higher flow of gases during inspiration when the baby needs a higher inspiratory flow of gas. And uh, when the baby wants to exhale, the infant flow driver or variable flow, C flow CPAP device permits some of the gas flow to be entrailed or routed across back to the atmosphere. And this is called as a coanda effect or fluid flip which is said to be the reason for the difference in flow during inspiration and expiration. And this is technically supposed to have um, to, uh, an effect of reducing the baby's uh, work of breathing, although most clinical studies do not necessarily show a more superior clinical efficacy with the use of infant flow driver CPAP versus the constant flow systems like the bubble CPAP. So this is another form of variable flow CPAP. Uh, which is called as the Benveniste valve device. Here, the gas jet directed through, uh, is directed through a ring towards the interface, and gas from the jet is inspired while expired gas is vented to the surrounding atmosphere. So basically, these uh, devices enable a higher flow of gas to be supplied during inspiration, and the expiratory flow rate of gas is lesser, and this permits the baby to have lesser work of breathing. CYPAP also works on a similar principle. So this uh, device um, allows the delivery of timed bi-level pressures. There is a peak pressure as well as the positive end expiratory pressure. And there are small increases in the pressure of two to three centimeters of water um, over and above the peak, which help in augmenting the functional residual capacity. So as we discussed, although there are uh, technical differences in the delivery of variable flow CPAP versus the constant flow CPAP devices, 
uh, two trials found lower excavation failures with infant flow driver CPAP, but two other trials found no difference or short term benefits of IFT over the ventilator CPAP. So the verdict between the variable flow CPAP versus constant flow CPAP devices is not very clear and not necessarily that of superiority of IFT. Uh, one large multicentric trial published in 2012 when looked at treatment failure or CPAP failure rates at in the both post extubation setting as well as the primary RDS uh, setting and did find that infant flow driver CPAP was associated with lower rates of uh, CPAP failure in the post extubation group but higher incidence of pneumothorax. There was also a lesser nasal injury that was noted with the variable flow CPAP. So to summarize, there are two different types of pressure generators, the constant flow and the variable flow CPAP. Variable flow CPAP does have physiological advantages over the bubble or ventilator CPAP. Clinical trials have not consistently demonstrated superior efficacy of variable flow CPAP over the constant flow CPAP device. So in any given unit, it is um, up to the choice of the clinicians to choose between the bubble CPAP or constant flow CPAP systems versus the variable flow system, CPAP systems. One is not necessarily superior than the other. Now coming to the clinical use of CPAP, the typical indications of using CPAP are a preterm neonate with respiratory distress, typically a neonate less than 35 weeks with a Silverman score or a respiratory distress score of more than equal to three, or a newborn with recurrent apneas, uh, or in the post extubation setting in preterm very low birth weight neonates or neonates with a weight below 1500 grams. CPAP may also be indicated in a term newborn with respiratory distress, typically started at a distress score more than equal to five or Silverman score more than equal to five. And this is common seen in indications in conditions such as uh, infections, pneumonia, meconium aspiration syndrome. We sometimes also use uh, CPAP for a term newborn with transient echidnia of a newborn. CPAP is only to be used in spontaneously breathing babies. This is a very, very important consideration to be noted. CPAP should never be attempted in a newborn with apneas and in newborn with, uh, not in recurrent apneas, like requiring positive pressure ventilation, or in a newborn with poor respiratory tract. There are some contraindications for uh, CPAP, particularly in a baby with poor respiratory drive, where the baby should be rescued either using invasive ventilation or using non-invasive um, NIMP. The other contraindications include a newborn with congenital diaphragmatic hernia with pulmonary hypoplasia, who is at high risk of air leak, a newborn with tracheoesophageal fistula, as well as neonates with shock or cardiovascular instability or airway anomalies like coinal atresia and cleft palate. So overall, um, with the increasing use of CPAP, studies uh, as well as um, experience of most neonatologists do show that CPAP is effective in the treatment of respiratory distress syndrome, especially when we compare CPAP with the use of oxygen by hood. Uh, this is a systematic uh, uh, review, and um, this showed that uh, there is reduced mortality by 48%, as well as reduction in the combined outcome of death and need for ventilation. There is also reduction in the need for up transfers, that is need for referral to a level three or a quaternary care unit, although there may be a tendency for a higher risk of air leak or pneumothorax by 2.6 times more. In the post extubation setting, neonates, particularly preterm very low birth weight neonates extubated to CPAP when compared to wood box oxygen, have lesser risk of extubation failure as well as lesser incidence of respiratory failure in the form of apnea, respiratory acidosis and increased oxygen requirement. And uh, when we look at uh, CPAP versus uh, food oxygen in the, um, in the management of post extubation respiratory distress, Again, it has been seen that there is a tendency towards reduction in extubation failure. 
this has been also substantiated from a meta analysis of uh, observation studies from lower and middle income countries so the benefits of cpap are not only for high income countries but also for low and middle income countries where there can be lesser coverage with antenatal steroids there may be a lot of babies who are outborn still cpap has been found to be associated with a two third lower risk of mortality among preterm infants who receive cpap versus food oxygen and 50% lesser need for mechanical ventilation so uh, as we had we have been gaining more and more experience with cpap in the moderately preterm infants late preterm infants um there was initially a hesitation to use cpap in extremely preterm newborns born below 28 weeks of gestational age but these uh, landmark trials support coin and uh, the delivery room study by vermont oxford network as well as purepap all these studies have, have uh, consistently shown to us that even among neonates who are born at gestational ages below 28 weeks you can see that support trial included babies between 24 plus 0 to 27 plus 6 weeks of gestational age and uh, a similar or overlapping gestational age range was enrolled in most of the other studies and when compared with uh, invasive ventilation or when compared with the routine strategy of insure while continuing on cpap cpap alone was found to be um, uh, associated with equivalent rates of the combined outcome of death and bronchopulmonary dysplasia and uh, it was um, reassuring that the use of cpap could be um, feasible and could be equally effectively used when compared to the strategy of routine intubation and mechanical ventilation most importantly in all these studies it was found that early cpap with subsequent administration of surfactant in those neonates who had an increased fao2 requirement by more than 30 to 40% was associated with lower rates of bronchopulmonary dysplasia and death when compared to the treatment of prophylactic or early surfactant therapy early cpap also resulted in a 50% reduction in the need for surfactant and the need for mechanical ventilation because cpap itself resulted in better alveolar recruitment and uh, the pressure required uh, required to keep the alveoli open was more effectively less reduced so coming back to the scenario as all of you rightly chose an option c where we continue cpap guiding the peep and the fio2 based on the clinical status of the baby and choose to administer surfactant only if fio2 requirement is more than 40% at 1 hour would be the right strategy coming to cpap interfaces there are different types of um, cpap interfaces for us to choose from although conventionally the single nasal prongs or the long nasal prongs which were being used studies have shown that single nasal prongs can be associated with higher risk of extubation failures because of the leak from the other nostril and uh, because of the increased resistance offered by a longer interface now all of us prefer to use the short binasal prongs as well as nasal masks among the short binasal prongs again we have different makes we have the short binasal prongs available from rj hudson draeger fisher and peckel and macket and uh, we also have uh, prongs that are available from uh, uh, some certain devices like the ift devices uh, infant flow driver cpap devices come with their own short binasal prongs too Uh, we also do not prefer to use nasopharyngeal cpap routinely for the similar reason that it offers increased length of the interface and hence increases the resistance of delivery this could also lead to ineffective delivery of p and endotracheal cpap uh, or hood box is also not being preferred for delivery of cpap uh, for um, th for the reason of higher resistance offered by the endotracheal tube and with hood box there can be significant leak so for all practical purposes the only two commonly used types of interfaces are the short binasal prongs and the nasal masks ram scanula although it offers uh, certain uh, practical advantages and feasibility and ease of easy application of the device may be associated with greater chances of um, leak and ineffective delivery of the pressure particularly offered by the increased resistance while gas flows across the long tubing so most 
um, clinicians consider RAM scanula as um, a glorified HFNC delivery uh, device. And in order to deliver CPAP, it may have to be supplemented with uh, uh, an add-on like a cannulite, which can help in reducing the leak around the RAM scanula. Nasopharyngeal tubes are again not preferred for delivering CPAP um, because uh, they, they may offer um, a higher resistance and they are also um, liable to get frequently plugged or blocked because of nasal secretions. And over a period of time, they may damage the nasal mucosa. However, um, uh, it does help in certain situations like in a baby with an airway problem like a Peary robin syndrome in helping to avoid intubation and it can transmit pressure directly into the lower airway. So these are the different types of binasal prongs that we use such as the RJ prongs, Hudson prongs and the Fisher and Pickle prongs. We shall be seeing the technique of fixation of one of these devices when we demonstrate uh, CPAP uh, shortly during this uh, session. Uh, this is another type of short binasal prongs called as the RJ nasal prongs. The um, a, a kind of um, a new uh, single use uh, socks is actually generally taken and cut and fixed in this uh, manner for being used as the baby CPAP cap because the RJ prong doesn't really come with an accompanying cap. This is the Hudson CPAP interface, which comes in various sizes. And this is generally fixed either using the Velcro technique or by using the figure of eight technique uh, using two rubber, rubber bands and the safety pins as shown in this uh, picture. Endotracheal CPAP is not preferred because it increases the work of breathing and the risk of atelectasis. Uh, due to the high resistance offered by the small diameter and the increased length of the endotracheal tube. And a Cochrane review forbids us from using endotracheal tube for delivering CPAP post extubation. This is another uh, interface called as the MAPIT CPAP device interface. It offers both nasal masks and short binasal prongs. So when we look at evidence, short binasal prongs have been shown to be clearly better than nasopharyngeal tubes and uh, single nasal prongs by achieving a uh, lower rate of reintubation among preterm infants and decreased oxygen requirement and respiratory rate. Studies comparing nasal masks and binasal prongs generally are unequivocal and they, are, they show that there is equal efficacy. Um, and uh, with both masks and binasal prongs. And in fact, masks are found to be safer and are associated with lesser risk of nasal injury uh, when compared to the binasal prongs. Now, when we start CPAP, we generally start with a peep of five centimeters um, or even higher if the baby has significant respiratory distress, significant retractions as per the unit policy with the FiO2 of 0 0.4 to 0.5. Now, PEEP is titrated based on the baby's work of breathing uh, as measured by the Silverman-Anderson score, respiratory distress and retractions, and uh, FiO2 requirement is titrated ba based on the baby's saturations. So if the baby has significant work of breathing, PEEP is increased in steps of 1 to centimeters of water until we reach a maximum PEEP of generally around 7, maximum 8 centimeters of water. Requiring PEEP of more than 7 or 8 centimeters of water is considered as CPAP failure. Likewise, if the baby has impaired oxygenation, FiO2 can be increased in steps of 3 to 5 percent to reach a maximum FiO2 of 50 or 60 percent, rarely 70 percent, and requiring FiO2 beyond 70 percent again is considered to be CPAP failure. So when we look at the best PEEP to start, um, there are studies that have compared higher versus lower PEEP at the time of initiation. Although high PEEP may be associated with lower rates of extubation failure and reintubation, the significant concern would be that of barotrauma and air leaks. So most of us prefer to begin with a PEEP of five or probably six centimeters of water. And as we discussed, a PACO2 of more than 60 millimeters of mercury or oxygenation PAO2, which is less than 50 millimeters of uh, mercury, Despite using maximum peak of uh, 7 or 8 centimeters with maximum FiO2 of 70% is taken as CPAP failure. Likewise, a baby developing recurrent apneas requiring positive pressure ventilation. 
spike to CPAP also is considered to have had CPAP failure. The clinical reasons or etiology for CPAP failure include a baby with poor respiratory drive or recurrent apnea, worsening parenchymal disease like worsening respiratory distress syndrome or worsening pneumonia, worsening meconium aspiration syndrome, a newborn who is developing IVH intracranial bleed, increasing metabolic acidosis, which again could be because of shock or myocardial injury, pulmonary edema, poor nutrition can also lead to CPAP failure, improper or inadequate fixation of the interface, and frequent dislodgement of the interface, or secretions obstructing the airways or interface. All these can be causes of CPAP failure. Inadequate flow and faulty machine. So technical aspects, technical problems in the machine resulting in suboptimal delivery of pressure in FAO2 can also result in apparent CPAP failure. So studies have looked at various predictors of CPAP failure, and uh, uh, these are some Indian studies that have looked at the same. Most studies have identified over overlapping clinical predictors for CPAP failure. These include an extremely preterm infant, gestational age below 28 weeks. Although we have seen in the COIN and SUPPORT trial, even in this group, majority of the infants, that is uh, more than 50% of the infants, can still be managed without mechanical ventilation. So this should not stop us from uh, attempting to give CPAP or attempting to manage these babies with CPAP wherever feasible. But in general, the risk factors for CPAP failure are less than 28 weeks gestational age, presence of prolonged pre-labor rupture of membranes, requirement of high respiratory support at the initiation itself. So this is represented by a product of CPAP and FIO2 crossing 1.28. Likewise, uh, incomplete course of antenatal steroids, the chest X-ray showing white out lungs, presence of large PDA, infection, Downing score more than seven when they initiate CPAP or a high FIO2 requirement. Uh, all these are, represent babies who are at higher risk of CPAP failure. So let us discuss something about the aspects of supportive care and monitoring of a newborn who's getting CPAP. So ongoing assessment of a baby who's on CPAP must include assessment of the infant, assessment of the interface, and assessment of the CPAP system. Now, airway uh, care and troubleshooting while delivering bubble CPAP are also important aspects of successful delivery of CPAP, as well as the provision of developmentally supportive care. So, uh, the, as already discussed, when we come to monitoring of a newborn who is on CPAP, this includes monitoring of the infant, monitoring of interface, some aspects of the interface and some aspects of the bubble CPAP delivery system. So in general, a newborn is said to be getting adequate CPAP if the baby is comfortable, has minimal or no chest retractions, with a Silverman score of less than or equal to two, and has a normal CRT or capillary refill time, normal blood pressures, and with saturations between 87 to 93%. On auscultation, we will hear continuous bubbling sounds um, on both sides of the chest. So the aspects to be monitored in the infant are um, color and comfort level of the baby, the baby's posture, vital signs such as temperature, heart rate, respiratory rate, capillary refill time, saturations, blood pressure, pulse volume, the urine output, the newborn's activity and tone, the newborn's responsiveness or alertness level. When it comes to the gastrointestinal tract, the presence of an orogastric tube, and this needs to be kept open 20 to 30 minutes after the feed is completed presence of abdominal distension and regular abdomen girth monitoring can be practiced when the baby is on CPAP once in four to six hours. When it comes to the CPAP settings, one needs to monitor vigilantly the FiO2 peep and flow. So these are the three parameters that are to be monitored from the uh, settings of CPAP. When it comes to respiratory monitoring, it is better to use a systematic or a structured tool like the Silverman Anderson score, which includes five parameters. The upper chest retractions, lower chest retractions, xiphoid retractions, nasal flaring, and the presence of grunting. Based on the scoring, the neonate can get a score between 0 to 10 for the Silverman's Anderson score on the whole. Each of these is graded as 0, 1, and 2, as shown in the figure. Uh, importantly, one should remember that upper chest represents the area above the mid axillary line, whereas the lower chest refer to the area below the axillary line when it comes to the Silverman scoring. 
So the presence of synchronized breathing of the chest and abdomen gives a score of zero, whereas the presence of inspiratory lag, that is the chest lagging behind the abdomen, gives a score of one, whereas uh, seesaw breathing or complete abdominal thoracic pattern of breathing gives a score of two when it comes to the upper chest retractions. The most of the other parameters are, 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 are scored as zero for their complete absence. If they are just visible, then one and marked uh, presence of the sign gives a score of two. So this must be repeated every two to four hours while the baby is receiving CPAP in order to see whether the baby is improving or the same or worsening. Position also warrants our attention and position changing is to be practiced once in four hours. Um, so optimal positioning of the baby includes placing the baby either supine or turning to one side or complete prone positioning. Now, while providing CPAP, it is important to um, allow nesting, which will promote containment and comfort and also um, improves neurodevelopmental outcomes as a part of developmentally supportive care. Airway monitoring improves moistening the, the nostrils with normal saline or sterile water at periodic intervals. The nose as well as the mouth as well as pharynx must be suctioned out for potential secretions that, that can be blocking the airway. And one must note the color and the consistency of the secretions. When it comes to the interface, it is very, very important to periodically assess whether the nostrils are symmetrical or whether they are unduly stretched, which sometimes happens because of ill-fitting um, nasal prongs, whether there is any blanching at the level of the skin over the nostril, and one should uh, note the size, shape, and position of in relation to the rest of the face, and note periodically, at least once in a shift, whether there is a skin breakdown or skin erosion. So one should note the color as well as the quality of perfusion over the nasal skin, over the nasal septum, and uh, uh, particularly pay attention to the areas for uh, which are at highest risk of nasal injury, such as the septum of the nose, the philtrum, and the columella. When it comes to monitoring of the CPAP system, one has to periodically inspect the flow meter to make sure that optimal flow is being delivered, as well as looking at the underwater bubble chamber to make sure that the right peak is being delivered to the baby. So the number that is just above the underwater chamber is the peep that is being delivered. And one also needs to make sure that the circuit is uh, completely closed without any areas of leakage. So note the CPAP pressure, the flow rate as well as the FIO2 reading from the blender. And one has to always ensure continuous adequate bubbling. This, is, this represents bubbling that is just optimally heard when one is standing close to the baby and should not be excessive bubbling or unduly soft, gentle bubbling as well. So uh, these are all the aspects that we just discussed. In the interface, one notes whether the prong has been chosen optimally, whether it is of correct size. We will discuss how it is to be chosen and whether the prong is in correct position without getting displaced, whether the cap is fitting the baby snugly and if the septum is intact. In the circuit, one notes whether humidification is optimal, whether the water level is filled until the chamber marking, and uh, whether the gas is uh, heated and humidified while being delivered to the baby. The tubings needs to be secured. When it comes to the bus system per se, one notes the flow rate, the FIO2, as well as the peak. And when it comes to the baby's position, the head should be in neutral position and duly supported with a neck roll. And one also makes sure that the airway is cleared by uh, optimal suctioning at an ideal frequency. So these are the aspects of a CPAP monitoring chart, uh, noting down the vital parameters of the infant. When it comes to the aspects to be checked in the circuit, one needs to make sure that the blender is working and the right FiO2 is being delivered. The gas flow rate is set at the level that we desire. Humidifier temperature is between uh, 36.8 to 37.3 Celsius. Water level is optimally filled in the humidifier and the circuit is well supported with um, uh, minimal condensation in the inspiratory tubing and a condensation regular usually present in the expiratory tubing, the presence of continuous bubbling, water present in the bubbling chamber and whether the, uh, the depth of the immersion of expiratory limb into the underwater chamber is optimal. The aspects to be checked when it comes to the interface are the choice of the correct size of the prongs, correct 
position of the prongs and whether the hat is fitting snugly into the baby and whether the mustache is effectively placed, especially when we are using the Hudson prongs and whether the septum skin is intact. CPAP is not a contraindication for feeding and feeding can be continued with the orogastric tube, which needs to be left open um, and uh, after half to one hour after the administration of the feeding. So only for the first 20 to 30 minutes after the administration of feed, the OG tube needs to be closed. Subsequently, it is important to ensure that the OG tube is left open in order to prevent CPAP build. A chest X-ray is usually indicated when we start CPAP or when the baby is admitted. Also, if there is any acute deterioration to rule out complications such as pneumothorax. Now, arterial blood gas is not mandatory while delivering CPAP to a preterm neonate. However, one may have to do a blood gas when there is a worsening clinical status or if there is poor respiratory effort to look for hypercapnia. There is no role for routine fluid restriction. Developmentally supportive care in the form of swaddling and containment and minimizing loud sounds as well as uh, bright light and promoting day-night cycling cannot be overemphasized by delivering CPAP. So also infection control and hand hygiene. Kangaroo mother care can be continued when the baby is stabilized on CPAP, although it may be a little difficult in the acute stage of the disease. And uh, one has to also remember that these babies may have some follow-up concerns and hence post-discharge, these babies definitely should be um, called back for an organized neurodevelopmental follow-up. Now, complications include pneumothorax or air leak, nasal obstruction, injury in the form of septal erosion, CPAP-related gastric belly and feeding intolerance, as well as IVH and PVL in preterm babies, as well as PDA. So pneumothorax is usually not due to CPAP itself and is generally because of the poor complaint lung uh, or the underlying disease and is not a contraindication for continuing CPAP. However, if there is worsening clinical status and worsening gas exchange, one may have to consider ventilation. In order to prevent air leak syndromes, it is important to avoid unduly high peep, especially a peep below above 8 centimeters, and also a flow rate of more than typically more than 8 liters per minute in uh, neonates. Uh, nasal septal injury is generally because of poorly fitted prongs or mobile prongs, or uh, frequently, um, which frequently are liable to get displaced. It may also be because of excessive moisture from gel and lubricants and duoderm like products. In order to prevent injury, it is very important to use appropriate sized prong, uh, which is neither too tight nor too small. Now, unduly small prongs can get frequently displaced, whereas unduly large prongs can lead to pressure over the nasal septum. The secure prongs um, appropriately by maintaining a distance of at least two millimeters from the bridge of the prongs to the septum and use uh, either a Velcro mustache shaped configuration for fixing a prong such as Hudson prong, or if one is using Fisher and Pickle prong, we may be fixing it with the uh, fixating slings on either side of the interface. It is important to avoid twisting of the prongs or avoid the circuit from bearing the prongs interface down uh, with its weight. And very, very important to evaluate the skin integrity every few minutes while delivering CPAP. So CPAP injury can be prevented to some extent by the use of uh, uh, skin fixatives, adhesives such as uh, Tegaderm. And if injury still happens, um, one, one needs to observe the color of the skin and periodic uh, cycling between the prongs and the mask or between prongs and high flow nasal cannula can be done in order to remove uh, some of the ill effects because of the pressure and friction. We discussed about gastric distension. So while feeding the baby on uh, CPAP, it is important to periodically decompress the stomach by letting the OG tube remain open 20 to 30 minutes after the feeding is completed. Now, PDA and uh, intracranial complications, such as a large IVH or PDL, are rarer complications. Again, are not directly related to CPAP. However, the use of high PEEP and high flow rates can be avoided in order to minimize the effects on the cerebral blood flow because of unduly high pressure being delivered. Uh, when the baby remains very agitated, it is important to handle the baby minimally. The use of nesting, containment, and swaddling can be very important to and agitation of the baby. 
uh, once we need to recheck if interface has been applied carefully and whether nasal septal injury can be avoided and periodic clearance of the airway can also be done because nasal obstruction can also lead to the baby remaining agitated so these are some important checklists for uh, troubleshooting uh, while the baby is on cpap now if the baby has uh, desaturation saturation going to less than 90% along with the presence of increased work of breathing in the form of increasing retractions uh, one first ensures adequate cpap delivery by ensuring continuous bubbling if this is happening then this is possibly because of the worsening parenchymal disease or it could be because of nasal obstruction as well so rule out nasal obstruction uh, by performing suction and uh, look at a chest x ray for ruling out worsening parenchymal disease whereas if the baby's problem is predominantly that of hypoxia and the baby is not having much retractions then this could be because of persistent pulmonary hypertension or due to a cyanotic heart disease or there can be a malfunction of the blender where fao2 required fao2 delivered may not be as much as what is actually being set or desired if the baby has uh, uh, desaturations increased work of breathing with poor air entry with absence of bubbling then the diagnosis in this case is clearly because of ineffective or inadequate delivery of cpap per se so to conclude um, cpap requires dedicated team work particularly along with our nursing colleagues and medical is monitoring is important while delivering cpap uh, in the form of monitoring the infant monitoring for an optimal airway and monitoring the cpap delivery system and prevention of complications so we shall briefly see the aspects of cpap delivery uh, bedside
So, um, so I'll, I'll start again. Blender, air, oxygen mix. Just uh, mute the other system. So. This is the air oxygen mix getting heated and humidified here. Heated humidifier and then through the inspiratory circuit, it comes to the baby. So this is the interface where we can either have the uh, mask or we can have the prongs. So while we are fixing CPAP, when it comes to the interface, there are three vital components. So one is the CPAP cap. Next is the flexi trunk or the nasal interface. So this is the flexi trunk. And then we have the interface proper. So these are the three vital aspects. Uh, for the first step for choosing the cap, we need to measure the baby's head circumference. So you measure the head circumference using a uh, inch tape. And uh, when it comes to this particular make, which is this is and paper, you have four different sizes of cap. So, inch tape. so you have cap starting from um, 15 to 18, 19 to 22, 22 to 25, 25 to 29, and then we have 29 to 36 centimeters. <coughs> So this baby's head circumference comes to 35 centimeters. So we will need to be, take the cap, which is 29 to 36 centimeters. Okay. And so this needs to be appropriately fixed on the baby so as to cover the ears of the baby. Next is choosing this flexi trunk or the nasal tubing. This again comes in 50, 70 and 90 millimeters length and uh, based on the weight of the baby, we choose the appropriate size of the nasal tubing. So if the baby is below 1 kg, we take the 50 mm uh, nasal tubing, 1 to 1.5, 70 mm. If the baby is more than 1.5, 90 mm tubing is preferred. This comes with these um, soft uh, sponges which are detachable. So based on the height that is required, we can either detach or leave them attached to the baby. And this will lie over the, the middle, the central part of the CPAP cap. And at the end of this, we have small uh, connectors here, which will go with the hinges of the nasal interface. So while fixing the cap, it is actually important that we, um, the cap completely covers the baby's ears and is parallel to the baby's forehead. And this part of the nasal tubing will directly overlie the central part of the cap. And based on the length, you can adjust how long you would want this to lie over the baby's forehead. Now, the final part of the CPAP uh, fixation is the interface. Now, the interface comes in different sizes, different size masks as well as prongs. So, special pickle comes with a sizing guide where you have um, nasal prongs identified by a four digit number. Uh, you have the first two digits, which represent the size of the baby's nostrils, and the last two digits that represent the width of the polymer. So there are nine to 10 different sizes represented by uh, permutations and combinations of these two numbers. So each prong will be identify identifiable with a four digit number. First two digits represent the nostril size. Last two digits represent the uh, width of the columella. So uh, we also have nasal mask, which is available, I think in four sizes in the frigid and paper. And based on the make, like for example, in Brager or Mackey, again, we have different sized nasal masks. And that size of the mask that optimally covers the baby's nostril without infringing on the eyes and the mouth is taken as the right size for that particular baby. So this is a nasal uh, sizing concentrator. So when we are choosing the nasal um, interface, we choose that size. For example, for this baby, this is too close. The width of the columella is not optimal. 
So maybe this or this size, both seem to be okay, wherein the nostril size is also completely um, enclosing the baby's nostril and the width of the columella is also optimal. So we will choose this size, which is 55, 60. 55 represents the internal diameter of the nostril and 60 represents the width of the columella part. With mask, it's relatively straightforward. We just see that size of the mask that completely encircles the baby's nostril. So this baby would probably do best with the L size mask. So after we choose this mask, we choose the, we connect it to this nasal tubing. And this needs to be fixed to the baby. So there are hinges on both sides of, sides of the cap that need to be connected to these hooks on the sides of the nasal tubing and while pulling, pull them concurrently both at the same time so that we prevent the prongs from getting excessively displaced to one side or the other. So this completes the fixation of the interface. And in order to prevent skin injury, it is important to use a skin friendly plaster such as duoderm, as you can see here. This can be left on the baby's skin in the mushtak area below the baby's So this can be left here in the mushtak area, uh, covering the filter. And likewise, well, while you're using the mask, you can leave it on the triangular area over the, uh, on both sides of the baby's nose. We also have readily available cannulates which are also essentially made out of duoderm. And they come in different uh, sizes and these come with holes in the center which permit the fixation of a prong. So duoderm helps us in substantially reducing the risk of nasal injury with masks as well as with prongs. So then the, the mask can be fixed above the interface like this. So now while monitoring the infant on CPAP, the monitoring aspects include some aspects in the baby, some aspects in the interface and some aspects in the circuit. So what are we monitoring? The monitoring the baby, the baby's hemodynamic status as monitored by a heart, the heart rate, CRT, pulse volume, blood pressure, urine output, respiratory rate, Silverman score, saturations, air entry, sensorium, abdomen girth, the, whether the abdomen is soft, whether the OG tube is left open 20 to 30 minutes after the feeding is uh, finished, sensorium, presence or absence of seizures, color, comfort, all these aspects are to be monitored continuously. When it comes to monitoring of the interface, one has to monitor whether it is in place, whether it's not displaced, any edema, skin changes, blanching, skin breakdown, whether there is excessive moisturization leading to skin infection, chance of infection, sometimes condensate coming over the, the interface, all these are to be noted periodically. When it comes to the circuit, the three important parameters that we are delivering on the machine are the flow rate, the FiO2, as well as the T. So right now, we are giving a peak of 6. So the peak that is being delivered now is a peak of 6. Likewise, the FiO2, which is delivered here from the blender and the flow rate are important. These are the three vital aspects of monitoring. Now, other very important aspect of monitoring is the presence of continuous uh, humidification. So we just switched on the humidifier now. So we discussed in the first session something about humidification, but we will discuss again the vital aspects. So while the, the blended mix of air and oxygen flows through the tubing and reaches the heated humidifier, it goes through the multiple ports of um, uh, the humidifier chamber where it passes through heated water vapor, becoming heated as well as humidifier. So as it exits from here, the temperature should be at room temperature, at body temperature, which is 37 degrees with 100% relative humidity. 
Now a heated wire is placed all through the inspiratory tubing in order to heat. Ongoing heating of gases is facilitated because of the heated wire. Um, and uh, it is present until this last segment where there is some drop in temperature that will happen. So until this segment, there is ongoing heating and this prevents condensation. There is no heated wire in the expiratory limb, hence condensation is a norm in the expiratory limb. So for ensuring adequate humidification, one has to ensure that the temperature when the air exits the humidification chamber is 37 degrees and the inspiratory circuit should have no condensation. Expiratory circuit will have some condensation and the baby should be comfortable. And of course, water level must be filled under the black line. What are the reasons we will not find condensation in the inspiratory tubing? Or sorry, what are the reasons we will find condensation in the inspiratory tubing? It could be because the heat wire can be malfunctional or it could also be because we may have sometimes kept this distal um, heater fro under directly under the warmer. This detects high temperature and suppresses the function of the heater wire. Likewise, we may sometimes not get condensation in the expiratory tubing if there is excessively high ambient temperature uh, or if there was not enough water in the humidification chamber itself. Then if it doesn't pick up water vapor, we will not see condensation in the expiratory tubing. So these are all some troubleshooting aspects. The last but not the least is bubbling must be present continuously throughout the respiratory cycle during both inspiration and expiration. This only ensures optimal delivery of pressure. If bubbling is not happening, then one must look for a leak from around the interface because of the excessively loose fitting interface or it could represent leak, circuit leak somewhere along the circuit or inadequate gas flow. So after ensuring that there is no leak anywhere, one has to increase gas flow if there is absence of bubbling. So look for circuit leak, look for leak from the interface or inadequate flow if there is absence of bubbling. Last but not the least, when it comes to the parts of the CPAP circuit, there are three important safety aspects here. So there are one, two, three knobs between the inspiratory limb and the heated humidifying chamber. These are from this order. This represents the knob for measuring the FAO. So if you see, if you open, there is a cap here. So this cap, you can place a FAO2 meter and measure the FAO2 that is being delivered. So if we are sitting at 30% FAO2, uh, we have FAO2 meter or oxygen sensor that, that is uh, commercially available. If you place the oxygen sensor, it must also be delivering 30%. This is the knob for pressure manometer. And this is a pop-off valve or a pressure relief valve and this comes with a number if you generally read it it will say that the pop-off uh, pressure will be around 30 or 40 centimeters of water so if the pressure exceeds that much then this will automatically pop off pop off as a safety mechanism so this is about the bubble seva so i think with that we'll conclude uh, today's session thank you all for joining mm -hmm. Thank you.